Great. So shall I go ahead and share my screen? I will carefully press buttons. Okay, great. Can everyone see the first screen there? It has um, the name of the presentation in it. Looks great. Great, thank you. So yeah, thanks so much, Sylvia. Thanks for everyone for inviting me to join your gathering to ask this question that we can discuss together of what does it mean if genetic engineering is the future of food? So Sylvia's introduced, oops. Sylvia's introduced CBAN, which is the Canadian Biotechnology Action Network. So we do monitor what's on the market, but also the issues that are raised by the use of genetic engineering in food and farming to share that information and to mobilize action where we um, agree on specific concerns um, that we share. And the member groups are quite diverse. So we bring together farmer organizations, environmental groups, social justice groups, and coalitions of grassroots groups. So it's a lot of different perspectives, a lot of experience over 20 years, quite a bit of memory on the issue of genetic engineering in Canada. And together we do have a platform of collaborative campaigning for food sovereignty and environmental justice. So that does point towards part of what we want to ask when we ask, what does it mean if gen genetic engineering is the future of food is, does it add to food sovereignty, this vision of food sovereignty that we have? Does it mean environmental justice? Um, these are the values that we are examining and the, the vision that we have. So this is a question for all of us to discuss today. I'm, I'll be really pleased to hear your um, views on what it would mean if genetic engineering is the future of food. I'll provide some information about the status of the technology now in society, and we can discuss what that means at this moment and what we might think it means into the future, especially as we do have some experience with the technology thus far. So what is genetic engineering? What does it mean? Objectively, it means, or at the very least, it means that we can move genetic material around. This is what defines genetic engineering is that we can directly change the genetic material of organisms in the lab, um, that you can change DNA sequences through direct intervention. So not relying on mating or reproduction, but actually going inside the organism to its DNA sequences and adding genetic material or removing genetic material or triggering the cell to make its own repair process. And so that is, you know, at least what it means in practice is that we can move these building blocks around. If we see them as building blocks, that we can move the blocks around. We can actually do that. But that doesn't mean that we know what it means. And this is where I think a lot of the discussion we have comes from is, um, is at a, on a number of levels, what does it mean that we can move these blocks around? And you will have seen this, this phrasing, this metaphor before, that DNA, these are the building blocks of life. And so already we have some kind of judgment embedded in genetic engineering um, into the science itself. And many of you earlier today, somebody referenced Bond and Shiva. There are critiques about how genetic engineering is very reductionist as a vision for how organisms work. And in fact, the early understanding of genetic engineering has been overthrown where the understanding of one gene for one trait is now understood to be scientifically incorrect. So this understanding of building blocks um, is not a, a full understanding of how genetics works. 
you can move the blocks around, but in fact, they have relationships between one another and with other parts of the environment inside the organism or outside it. So this is to say that even the science itself, you know, has some judgment and values or ideas embedded in it. So what does it mean? Well, in fact, you know, a hypothesis around what DNA is and how we can use it, it can function and still be incorrect. But this is also to say that genetic engineering is a science, but it's not just a science. And that's what I wanted to talk to you today about or have a discussion with you about is how genetic engineering is also a technology, its products, its profit, its vision, ideology, and it's about relationship. And this is a, an early ad maybe from 2013 from Monsanto. So the promise, of course, the promise that we're most familiar with is that we can use genetic engineering to improve agriculture and improve lives. And in fact, the small print here makes reference to better seeds and to get more from each acre, each raindrop, each seed and improve people's lives. So what does it mean? Well, have we managed to improve agriculture? So far, after 20 years, this is what genetic engineering looks like on the market. This is the sum total, in fact, of all the genetically engineered crops around the world. Um, but it's also what's grown in Canada is um, what's grown in Canada and then also what ends up in our market from the US. So corn, canola and soy will be very familiar to you. Some sugar beet, which is white sugar beet that's only used for processing into sugar. Uh, alfalfa, which is only animal feed, not alfalfa seeds that you would use for sprouting. And you will have heard of the first genetically engineered food animal, which is an Atlantic salmon, now being produced on land in Prince Edward Island. And some papaya and squash that can be coming from the United States. There is a genetically engineered apple also designed to be non-browning that could end up in Canada through food service, like through catering. Um, it's not yet the case, but it would be hard to track at this point, but it's a very small amount. But you can see after 20 years, 25 years almost, there are nine crop types that have been genetically engineered. And in Canada, you know, it's really corn, canola, soy, and sugar beet, but there is a high uh, adoption rate of the technology in those crops. So almost all of the canola grown in Canada is genetically engineered. Most of the corn and approximately 60% of the soybean and all of the sugar beet, but we don't grow a lot of sugar beet. Globally, this is the same, that around the world, you know, and this may contradict some of what you understand or have heard about um, what genetic engineering provides by way of different types of crops on the market, that 50% of all of the genetic engineered crops grown, grown are soybean, then it's corn, canola, and soy, uh, cotton, cotton, corn, and canola. Um, and this is, you know, this is leaves less than 1% are, you know, things like the apple that I mentioned or the papaya or squash. And there are almost 100% of all of those genetically engineered crops have just one or both of two traits, which is herbicide tolerance, which many of you will be very familiar with, which is genetically engineering a plant so that it will withstand spraying of a particular herbicide. Even if the plant is really young, it can then survive the spraying, it makes it more convenient for farmers, easier to manage weeds. And then plants that are insect resistant. So if an insect pest tries to eat the plant, the insect will die. So making the plant itself into a pesticide. So these are the two traits that are almost 100% of all of the traits grown globally. And in fact, in Canada, all of the genetically engineered plants now grown 
are herbicide tolerant and some of them are also insect resistant. So you can see they're herbicide tolerant and both traits. That actually means that 88% of all the world's genetically engineered crops are herbicide tolerant. 45% of those are both herbicide tolerant and insect resistant. So, um, and just to say this is called, the title of this is GM traits. So I'm referring to genetic modification and genetic engineering as the same thing, just using the terms interchangeably with GM being the most sort of common way of referring to the technology. So you can see that, you know, after 20 years, there's some limits here as to what's happening. This improvement of agriculture has been limited and it's been limited by the technology, but also by who owns the technology, how it's been, how this vision has been articulated thus far. And so what does it mean thus far? What has genetic engineering meant to this moment? And certainly it has entrenched chemical agriculture. There's a dominant system of agriculture um, that's used behind the growing of corn, canola, and soy already. This use of herbicides, for example, and with all these herbicide tolerant traits, you have seeds that are designed to be sold with herbicides. And the result is that any kind of promise for a reduction in pesticides certainly hasn't been the case. In Canada, there's been an increase in herbicide sales of 243% since the introduction of genetic engineering, which is not a direct correlation. In fact, it's very hard to find the statistics. They don't exist. But that is to say that there has been no reduction and the use of the technology to this moment has been incorporated into that system of chemical dependence where farmers are dependent on buying inputs. So not only buying chemicals, but also buying seeds to go with them. And the other major character of the use of the technologies thus far is corporate control that investments in genetic engineering have increased corporate profits. They have increased the ability of companies to make money and they've bought seed companies. So these companies have grown bigger. So Bayer used to be Monsanto or Bayer has, has bought Monsanto. Corteva may be a new name to you. That's Dow Chemical and DuPont merged together and made this company called Corteva. And if you look at the seeds pie there, Syngenta, Corteva and Bayer, those three companies together control approximately 48% of the global commercial seed market. And those same three companies, Bayer, Corteva and Syngenta own 53% of the agrochemical market which is pesticides and herbicides. So three companies alone account for approximately half of all the global commercial seed and pesticide markets. And there you can see a direct relationship between making money from genetically engineered seeds and from pesticides and the type of expertise these companies have and their interests. So I think it's fair enough to say that these, this is really the dominant character of the use of genetic engineering thus far is corporate control and consolidation, you know, facilitated by the patenting of seeds and uh, entrenchment in chemical agriculture. But that doesn't mean to say that's necessarily gonna be the future of genetic engineering. Is it possible that this um, uh, promise of improved agriculture could still be the case. Could we see something different? And just to uh, return to corporate control, herbicide sales, these two impacts of genetic engineering were predicted. And just to say that if we think about genetic engineering as a science, well, we can't expect scientists to understand that the use of herbicide tolerant traits might mean or would mean increased herbicide use or that patenting of seeds is gonna mean corporate control. So there is a disconnect here between, you know, the excitement around the science 
and then the promise to improve agriculture and improve lives. So what are we looking at now? How might the story of genetic engineering change? How might, the, how might what it mean changes? Well, the perfect fruit just got even better with this non-browning genetically engineered apple. Of course, we already have naturally slow browning apples. This apple is for sale in the United States, but only in plastic bags. There's a market in the States for sliced apples and that's where this apple sits and is likely to sit for a long time, meaning it won't be a, an apple in the produce section. But it's a better apple, just like there's a better potato being um, produced in the United States that could end up in the market in Canada um, with various different traits. So there's this question then of, can genetic engineering make things better? Of course, farmers are always improving seeds and animals through traditional breeding. Um, but what are the values here? What, what are we deciding is better and who gets to decide? And this is um, the cover of a, a sort of environmental pledge that, farm, that Monsanto made, I think in 2008, it's called Seeding Values. And really, um, this is the question at hand is, what are our values and how do we want to see those reflected in the food system? Or how do we want to see the food system reflect them? So one of the big shifts in the past few years has been the commercialization of the first genetically modified food animal, which is this Atlantic salmon. And this is where it lives um, in, inside, in on-land facilities. This is in Prince Edward Island at Rolo Bay. Um, which is a new facility. And it has, it, the first quote unquote harvest of this genetically engineered salmon from Prince Edward Island has not yet happened, but it could happen any day. It's close to being um, produced for the first time in Canada. It has been on the market, but from a small plant in Panama. So this is what the building in Prince Edward Island looks like. So what does it mean if we're genetically engineering a salmon well, we're, we're not relying on the ecosystem anymore for producing the salmon. We can do that on land across, across the street from an ecosystem. Is it a functioning ecosystem? Not for Atlantic salmon, that's an endangered species. And so if we look at the new products of the apple and salmon, this is what they look like. They're sort of wrapped in plastic in a contained facility um, and the question in, then is, you know, how does it come to this point? How do we get products to this point where, well, did we have any say? Did you ever sort of think, oh yeah, we, we really do need sliced non-browning apples in a plastic bag and Atlantic salmon is endangered. So yeah, let's produce it on land. And if we can make it grow faster, which is what the salmon is engineered to do, let's do that. Well, who makes the decision? Aqua Bounty is the name of the company in Prince Edward Island. This is kind of perhaps an unfair slide. This is from several years ago outside their small research and development facility. Um, doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Um, but this small company decided that a genetically engineered fast growing salmon was better and that it would be a good idea. And they say it will help feed the world. Um, but in fact, there's no one else who gets a say in that question. There's no labeling in Canada for people to decide if they want to eat it or not. And there's no consultation with Canadians about, well, do we want this product on the market? Um, except, you know, when people find out about a product, for example, this genetically engineered pig called EnviroPig, um, there has been a public decision. Enough of a protest was articulated that the the pig farmers, the hog farmers said, okay, we won't market that because they had actually invested in this environment, EnviroPig. It was called EnviroPig because it was genetically engineered to have less phosphorus in its feces. So of course, when you have thousands of pigs raised in industrial settings, there's a huge amount of waste produced, phosphorus pollution from that waste. And so the idea of how to make how to use genetic engineering or how to make things better with technology 
in this case, the solution, which was accidentally found at the University of Guelph, was to make the pig better. So not to change our, the way we raise pigs to manage the waste better, um, or in fact, to manage how we consume um, pigs, but to make the pig itself better. And there's a judgment here. There's a, an idea of what the solution is and um, how the technology could be made to be beneficial. And then again, this question of, well, who decides? How was that decided? And of course, in the case of genetic engineering, we're, we're talking about living organisms. And so once released, actually, we better be sure what we wanted because in some cases it could be very difficult or impossible to recall the living organism from the environment. And CBAN has documented the contamination incidents in Canada thus far. Some of them are escape incidents that were easily contained like with wheat or pigs, but we know that these organisms can escape. And in that case, um, what does, what does it mean when they escape? Well, um, has, you know, in some cases, well, in all cases, it wasn't examined what the economic or social cost would be of contamination, which is why farmers protested the commercialization of genetically injured alfalfa in particular. And this is where this photo is from, um, is from the day of action against GM alfalfa because alfalfa is important in all kinds of small farming operations, including organic farming. And it's very susceptible to contamination, like it will move around. So, you know, who gets to decide? GM alfalfa was still approved. It's not sold in Western Canada because there's a great deal of alfalfa grown in Western Canada that's also exported. So there's a sort of political fight around this issue. Um, only partially resolved because people intervened to try and have a say. And yet we are asked even after, you know, 20 years um, to believe, this is from a Monsanto ad, is we believe in this promise of genetic engineering. Um, we believe that companies will come up with not only the technological solution, but the right application of the technology, the appropriate application of the technology. So, you know, farmers don't get to say um, what they want, except on the market, which is, as we saw with the pie charts of corporate control, is dominated by big companies. And so there may actually be less choice than we would think, um, but we're, we're asked to believe. And the promise has only accelerated with the new techniques of gene editing. So genetic engineering has these new techniques um, that you know, can not only feed the world, which kind of is a promise that kind of got supplanted by this new great promise, which is that genetic engineering can now help us with the climate crisis, um, that we can feed ourselves even if we destroy our ecosystems. This is a slide from a new corporate promotion site for gene editing um, called Nature Nurtured. And you will have heard perhaps about gene, gene editing in the newspapers. Uh, it's more accurately called genome editing because you, it's more than just about snipping a gene here and there or deleting a gene. Um, perhaps more familiar is the words CRISPR, this acronym for one of the techniques of gene editing. It's been much celebrated and talked about. It's very powerful. So it does mean that the tools of genetic engineering may be faster, they may be cheaper, more companies or public institutions might be able to get into the action of genetic engineering. And so it has been um, accompanied by these promises of, okay, so maybe for 20 years, all we could come up with was herbicide tolerant traits, insect resistant traits in corn, canola, and soy. But now the technology itself can do much more. And if it's cheaper and faster then actually it doesn't have to be all about what Monsanto wants, because of course Monsanto wants corn, soy, wheat, rice, potatoes, the big crops. But maybe now with these new techniques, we could see all kinds of crops um, that smaller companies might invest in crops that are uh, a smaller niche crop. 
So we have a resurgence of the promise around genetic engineering. And that has come with um, some new proposals from our government. And earlier today, somebody mentioned an, an opinion piece that's in the Chronicle Herald this weekend from the filmmaker Aube Giroux, who made the film Modified, this documentary. And her opinion piece is about this change in how the government wants to regulate genetic engineering. So with the new techniques of gene editing, the government is um, suggesting that, well, they're more powerful, they're safer, uh, we can just go ahead and let companies put them on the market. If they don't have foreign D DNA left in the organisms, um, companies can decide if they're safe. So if you wanna go to our website, there is a public consultation that ends at the end of tomorrow. And that I'll, I'll put this um, web address back up later as well, but that web address for cban.ca slash no exemptions, you can see an instant action there that you can send an email to Health Canada or you can find out some more information. But all that is to say that this newfound like resurgence of the promise of genetic engineering is, is accompanied by proposals from the government to facilitate the role of gene editing, the role of genetic engineering in agriculture. Um, and then, you know, what does that mean? Well, if the current structure of regulation and policy continues to be the order of the day, it means companies come up with a product based on, you know, what they can manage and what they want to put on the market. And if it's safe under whatever regime, whether that's rigorous or not, if the government decides it's safe, it will get onto the market. And consumers and farmers don't have a say in that. So will, it, will genetic engineering be the future of farming? Well, uh, the structures are set up to help allow for that to happen. So DNA could be these building blocks, but in fact, you know, DNA in the way that we're using genetic engineering DNA is also discussed as life's blueprint, that it, it can tell us how we want to live. It can give us the tools to live. We don't even need ecosystems that are functioning. We can construct life forms and we can even construct ourselves through genetic engineering or construct the vision of who we are. Like, are we made of DNA? Um, and, you know, what relationship do we have to other organisms? How do we see our own organism? That life is DNA and that through understanding, even in a limited way, because it's very limited, understanding that DNA exists and we can move it around and make changes, even if we don't fully know what that means, that we have found the secret of life. That now that we know what DNA does enough to make new organisms, even if we don't really know all of the features of those new organisms, we can do things like genetically engineer a tree. And the proposal now for what genetic engineering could mean is that it could mean that if we have a failing forest, if we see the health of our forest decline, that we can intervene and replace some of those dying species. And this is what is actually proposed at the moment in the United States and soon in Canada. You, many of you may remember the American chestnut, which is an endangered species in Canada and it's functionally extinct in the United States. Very important tree, it was really important source of food in the forest, an important timber tree, um, but a blight devastated the populations. And um, a laboratory of uh, university scientists has come up with a blight resistant American chestnut tree. And the scientists are proposing that, well, we can restore 
the American chestnut to North American forests, this is the East Coast, um, by planting genetically engineered trees in the wild. And so this is a, an important test case for our idea of tolerance to genetic engineering, how we might, may accept or not the role of genetic engineering in our future. And the technology is so powerful that now, and some of you may have heard of this new application of gene editing, which is to create gene drive technologies where you can release an organism into the wild and the organism can override um, in the regular inheritance um, uh, principles and permanently modify or eliminate a population in the wild. So not only can we replace uh, specific species with a genetically engineered American chestnut tree, for example, we can introduce a genetically engineered mosquito into the environment that would you know, be designed to make the mosquito disappear essentially. So our ability to change organisms and populations and species is accelerating. And this begs us to really think then what it means. And this is where, you know, CBAN can provide information and ask questions in community, but it's really, um, it's really important for us to discuss together, which is why it's great that um, we're able to have this discussion here today is, and I just put the slide up to, finish the presentation of questions around relationship and you know how we want to see our our food system reflect our values um, and how we see ourselves and want to see ourselves in relationship to the organisms that sustain us including you know our own organism so this is again the the website if you want to take action tomorrow um, you can send an instant action, an instant letter to Health Canada about regulation, or you can just take a look there and see what's happening with this consultation. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. And then um, perhaps if I, I meant to sort of stop halfway and ask if people had questions about some of the information I provided about what's on the market. Um, but I'm very interested to hear your commentary on this question of what does it mean? And looking into the future, um, what do you think genetic engineering could mean if it is in fact, as the industry says, it, it wants this to be the future of food? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy.